Baruch Hashem, you're a bad Jew. Shalom. You're listening to another episode of Bad Jew. And with me today, I have the honor of bringing on a client from Mr. Thrive Media, that's my company, onto this podcast, host of the Road of Philanthropy, head and founder of of Painted Rock Advisors is none other than Gary S. Cohen. Gary, welcome to Bad Jew. I'm really happy to have you here. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, of course. It's sincerely my pleasure. Gary, the host of The Road to Philanthropy here, it's this podcast about the nonprofit and philanthropic world, and there is a lot of Jewish crossover in that show. But today, we are specifically focusing on that Jewish crossover, obviously. So with that being said, you know, Gary is a pro. He's watched the show. He's watched Bad Jew rise up the ranks since it started. Uh, Please be sure to leave five stars and a comment, by the way. Just saying. Gary. Are you ready to do the Bad Jew Challenge, telling your life story in four minutes? I am ready. I rehearsed it for three minutes, and I'll probably go five. Excellent. Echad, Shtaim, Shalosh. Well, yes, I, I actually was born back in the 50s. And when I was born, I realized there was another baby in the room. And I said, who the hell is that? And it turned out to be my twin brother. And that is a shock. So now it's uh, some 60 plus years later, and uh, we still are seen in the valley, and people confuse us. Uh, I started my life in the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw area, which was a Jewish community until the Wash riots in 65, where all the Jews left and uh, went elsewhere. I ended up in Inglewood, went to Inglewood High School. I went on to college. I got into UCLA, wanted to be an accountant, couldn't be an accounting student there. So I went to Long Beach State. I got my finance degree because accounting homework was too hard for me. I didn't have time for that. I worked my way through school, working three jobs and 40 hours, 50 hours a week, whatever it was, doing all kinds of stuff. And uh, from there, I went into the food service industry for about a year. I had worked my way through school as a student manager in the Cal State Long Beach Food Service. I was in charge of all the student workers, including some of the graduate students who worked in the cafeteria and became TAs of mine and gave me very good grades in those uh, in those sessions. And then uh, after I spent a year in the in the food service industry, uh, I decided to make a move into the banking world and put my finance degree to work. So I was a banker for about 17 years, primarily in the apparel industry in downtown L.A. And some of my clients that I started out with, I gave the fifth, first $50,000 to buy denim and guest jeans started, which was a good thing. They, they don't remember me anymore, but I remember them. It was a good thing. Uh, from there, I, I spent a few years with uh, Manufacturers Bank and then Union Bank of California which transferred me up to San Francisco. And uh, about two years after that, in the early 90s, they said, we want to transfer me back to LA and move me to Beverly Hills and make me a young senior VP. And I was going, yeah, this is great, fantastic. I'm a superstar. Until I came home and told my wife, and she said, we're not moving back to LA. <laughs> and I went, okay, well, okay, I got to find something else to do because the banker, the president of the bank said, if you don't move to LA, you're not going anywhere with us. So I got out of banking and I ended up in the nonprofit sector. I ran Temple Emanuel in San Francisco, a large reform congregation. I figured for a year or two, I'd do it and then go back to banking, but I ended up staying 17 years or close to 17 years. I had 16 great boards of directors. The 17th one said, bye-bye, time to move on. So I moved on to the Technion University, Israeli uh, high-tech university, raising money for them on the West Coast. Moved on to the Jewish Agency, spent a few years at Alzheimer's Association, decided I was tired of travel, time to open my own practice. So now I have Painted Rock Advisors, and we do consulting in the nonprofit world, both Jewish and non-Jewish worlds, uh, a lot of different mix of clients. And I started a podcast a couple of years ago uh, and had the great producer, Chaz Volk, helping me out. And now we've got like 30 plus episodes under our belt. We do one a month. I'd love to increase it to more, but I haven't had the funding to do that yet. And this year, the Chronicle of Philanthropy and uh, I want to say BuzzFeed, but it was something else, uh, ranked me as the number 12th uh, podcast in the top 35. So people are listening. I'm having fun. That's it. What more can I say? Now, how many minutes did I take there? Oh, you got 25 seconds left. So oh, I man. want to fit in okay. there. 25, I love rock and roll. I love jazz. I love classical. And I'm a baseball fanatic. 
and I love LA Football Club. What more could you want? Love it. Gary, that was awesome. You nailed the Bad Jew Challenge. Welcome to the show. It's really a privilege to have you here. So let me let me tell you about my experience as a YJP, a young Jewish professional, right? More often than not, I'll be invited to a program somewhere out here in West LA. Sometimes it's in the Valley. Sometimes it's in Long Beach, wherever it is, right? And I go about those events and I walk in free of charge. And I also get food free of charge. Sometimes there's even alcohol free of charge. And I have I think a lot of YJPs have just accepted, well, there's clearly a cash flow in the Jewish nonprofit world. You know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. So with that concept, yeah, money is circulating and that it's there are well-funded programs. But I've never really gone further into that as to, first of all, why that money even exists in that place. And then second of all, um, why Jewish nonprofit organizations appear to be so much stronger than other nonprofit organizations in comparison. And I don't mean to draw comparisons to say that one is stronger or better than the other, but being a Jew in LA in your twenties is pretty awesome. Why is that? Well, I think one of the challenges, if you go back to the eighties and nineties is there is a, a number of reports that came out talking about Jewish continuity and that people weren't connecting to their Judaism. And so a lot of non-Jewish nonprofits through money and trying to reach out and capture the younger adults that were coming up through the summer camp world and, and synagogues. Um, but if you go back to the, I remember the 80, uh, 80s, 90s, uh, when I was running Temple Emmanuel, uh, we had a, a consortium of, of synagogues getting together with one of the big funders. And I remember I said, you know, we all have to do something different because if 75% of the people were not buying a car, the car manufacturer would change the car to try to attract new buyers. And if 75% of the Jews are not affiliated in Jewish life, we're doing something wrong. How do we reach them? What do they want that we're not offering them? And I think that's when money started to flow towards things like Moisha House and in the Northern California area, Wilderness Torah, which once a month, they take young Jews on hikes through the redwood trees and they stop for an hour and teach Torah, a number of different things like that. And so I think that money has been thrown that way in order to attract and try to keep Jews in in the family, if you will, or in the tribe. Sure, sure. That that social life that you just kind of described that is facilitated by organizations is something that is very prevalent and very real in my Jewish life. As a matter of fact, if it didn't exist, I wouldn't have met my girlfriend, Kelly, um, because we met through a Moisha House event. So, <laughs> you know, it's very it's very real. But is it strictly about the money? Is that is the money really the only reason why the nonprofit world is successful? Well, no, I think there's fundamental teachings in, in Torah that tell us that we need to take care of each other. I mean, if you look at Leviticus 19, which is in the Torah, the holiness code, it talks about taking care of your brethren, talk, you know, feeding the poor, clothing the homeless, not putting blocks in front of the blind. And then there's a section which we call peya. Peya is the corners of the field. And the Torah commands us that when you're harvesting your field to leave the corner of the field unharvested so people that need to come and get food can get food and not be embarrassed having to ask for food or anything else. And so there's a whole teaching throughout Judaism about that. And if you look at the Pirkei Avot, which is the teachings of the fathers, the sages, Hillel, and other great rabbis, we also have a lot of teachings there about taking care of each other and being good to each other. I think that's really inspiring and really beautiful. I love that Torah has very much been incorporated into these nonprofits as, as very well it should be. Do you see that same kind of engagement happening in other organizations across the country? Well, I think the, the difference is that most Jewish nonprofits will start a board meeting of their board with a Devar Torah or a teaching, either led by a rabbi or led by one of the board members. And in a non-Jewish nonprofit, they have something called a mission moment where they talk about for five minutes, their, uh, someone speaks about the mission of the organization and how they've connected people. So when I was Alzheimer's, we would bring in uh, someone who used our services as a caregiver for their family and they'll talk for three or four minutes and that would be our mission moment. Uh, so there are 
similar things in non-Jewish organizations, trying to motivate the board as to why we're here, why do we exist, why are we doing this, and, and to do our business on the board to make sure that the outcomes, you know, fulfill our mission, whatever that mission is. I think that's really fascinating. That really ties into this article that I found by Leading Edge over here. Leading Edge, they put together a, uh, a, a survey out there. They found these statistics that the first, the good news in the Jewish nonprofit world is that people in the nonprofit field are pumped about their missions. Employees at Jewish organizations are overwhelmingly proud to work at their organizations. That's at a 90%. Another 90% believe that they know how their work contributes to their organizations. And 91% agree that they believe their organization provide quality services to their communities and uh, respected by, and they feel respected by their managers. So these are all great things. Now, on the flip side of it, this survey site, Leading Edge, also came up with these statistics as well after doing a survey that show some areas that are actually harming the nonprofit world. And that is that only 46% are minority employees. 42% feel that the organizations are understaffed. Another 42% say that the salaries are, you know, fair, fair relative to similar roles in the organizations, which means that promotions aren't really that rewarding. And 37% say that the salaries and raises are determined by their organizations and not really by their work. So these are things that are actually harming the organization. So it is definitely a part that is played that impacts the Jewish communities and how either YJPs like me are impacted or even even senior citizens or companies out there that might get support from the nonprofit world. There's a whole network here that is impacted by those statistics. Well, going back about 10 years, there was a, a, a I forget his name offhand, who did a TED talk that talked about we have to treat nonprofits like businesses and pay the people well to do the jobs they're doing. And one of the challenges, if you look at the Jewish Federation system throughout America, they bring young Jews in at really lousy salaries. About a third of them survive and stay long term and move up to the top. And the CEOs of the Jewish of the Jewish federations are making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars wherever the cities are. But the entry level jobs are at 40, 50, 60,000. And you can't live in San Francisco or Los Angeles at 50,000 a year. Right. And so you look for other work at some point in time. I think there's also an old adage that people work in nonprofits because they really want to do good work and they're not really concerned about compensation. That's bullshit. That does, that's not true at all. That's just <laughs> old fashioned thinking. You know, I remember when I was running Temple Emmanuel and I, I raised the, the, the salaries of the maintenance guys up to the salaries of the administrative staff. So I had maintenance guys making $50,000 a year at the time. And I had a board treasurer say, what the hell are you doing? I said, there's no one more important to the organization than those maintenance guys because they are taking down and setting up rooms 24 hours a day for our programs. If they don't do their work well and have fun and enjoy what they're doing, and they're more valuable than someone answering a phone. And they greet people. In fact, when the head maintenance guy at Temple Emanuel retired after 30 years, Luis, who I still am in touch with, even though I've been gone from the synagogue for 12 years, he still comes once a month on a Saturday morning to be a, a usher and host and greet people because he's part of the community. Wow. And that's part of what the Federation hasn't really done a lot of and other nonprofits. I mean, there was a, a nonprofit recently that posted a job on uh, a job posting for that. A lot of Jewish jobs are posted on run by one of the Jewish foundation guys in L.A. And the, the salary was at like 40,000 a year. And I responded to the organization. Who are you going to find at 40,000 a year that has five years of experience? Right. Are you crazy? That's just, well, that's our budget. And I'm that's what I work with. You know, I'm like, well, okay, fine. Then you're gonna have to turn over people constantly. That's yeah. just an insult that even those wages get offered. And you know what? I'm a proponent of that one of those statistics that you brought up where you talked about the Jewish Federation system in America. You know, I worked for the Jewish Federation, as you know, Gary. I used to work for something called the PJ Library, which is this awesome organization that send has a subscription service where basically for just being Jewish, you subscribe to it and they get you. If you're a child between the ages of zero and eight years old, one free book a month. That it's a great program, yeah. It's a really great program. I used to work for it, and I loved the job. I had a really wonderful relationship with my boss and his boss, and I was getting to know that department pretty well and pretty closely until June of 2020 pops up, and then I got laid off. 
<laughs> and it happened real quickly out of nowhere. And you know what? I to, to be fair, it was a very difficult time. 2020 was a year marked by the instability of unprecedented times and unprecedented leadership. So with that being said, you know, I was totally impacted by that. I did not quote unquote survive, right? So I definitely did not make the one third mark. I was cut below that. In fact, I was um, hurt by the unions, the union tool called bumping. Are you familiar with that? Right. I am very familiar with it. For those who don't know what bumping is, it's basically when if you get if you get laid off, your union gives you the right to bump your firing to someone else because you have more seniority over them. And so long as it stays within a certain category of employment, it will go off to someone else. So you can get bumped by one person, then that person bumps to another person, then that person bumps to another until the person at the very bottom of the line has to take the brunt of that of that firing. Well, and actually, then what I happens, see. though, is that whoever bumped you takes on your old job. Right. Right. So that's that's the act of bumping. That's what happened to me is that's how I unfortunately departed from the Jewish Federation. I still have a great deal of respect for the organization and what they've done and the last resources they've allocated. But that is just the reality of what happened is that I was bumped. Well, I think one of the challenges of of any organization, a nonprofit or a business for-profit businesses, how do you engage and uh, motivate the staff around you? You know, a great leader, someone said, why, Gary, did you turn out to be a great leader? And I said, well, I learned, you know, I came from a very bad background. I worked my way through school from my 16 years of age on. I was getting evicted with my family out of apartments when I was in my teens. And I learned, you know, that you have to treat people well in the job world. And I got to break my teeth in college managing student workers mm -hmm. and their hours and what hours they wanted and things like that. And I think that you can't, you, you can't teach someone motivation, but you can give them the essence of the parts that help motivate them, whatever it is. And so I always said to, to people who work with me, I'm not gonna micromanage you. I hired you, you're good, do your job. When you need help, come to me. If you hit a brick wall, I'm there to help and support you. And I think that's what great nonprofit leaders do is they motivate the staff, they support the staff, and they let them do their great work and not get in the way. What are some tips that you would give to management and nonprofits to do better at their jobs? I would say uh, one is talk to your employees on a regular basis. You know, I would uh, I call it walking the shop, if you will. And when I ran a, a, an institution, I'd walk around every day and see every staff member and greet them and know what's going on. Even the preschool teachers who I had ultimate authority for, but not daily authority, they all knew me. I would walk through the rooms and check with them after the kids left. All the, you know, the custodians, uh, the maintenance guys, you know, the first World Cup came during that. And they were on, I heard they're all down watching the World Cup in, the, in, the, in their room on a black and white TV. So I went down and I sat down and watched the game. I left and I love soccer. So I watched the game with him. And one of the guys got up, uh, Pilar, and he said, I got to go back to work. And I said, why? The game's not over. And he goes, well, but I got to go back to work. My time's up. And I said, well, your boss is here and I'm here and we're not leaving. So you're not leaving either. <laughs> so it's part of that is just doing the right things with people. I think also the other thing that's very important is training. What are the skill sets that the people need to keep moving up in the world, in their job, in the organization, or in broader jobs? I mean, the thing I'm most proud of is there are half a dozen executive directors or development directors throughout California that started working with me as entry-level people. And when they wanted to move on, I helped them move on. I helped them move up. I've always kept in contact with them. Uh, and today, some of them are very, very, very successful. And they look back and one of the guys says, it wasn't for you giving me some training. I wouldn't be where I am today. You know, Wow. So. Wow. Well, that's incredible. And these are these kind of tips that you are describing here on the show. This is what you do with Painted Rock Advisors, right? You step into a nonprofit and you basically help them run smoother on the back end. So that way on a development level, they can get their employees trained. They can get their staff up and running with a more efficient program. That's what you do, right? Right. I do a lot of that. I did. I do a lot of things with board governance and board leadership. Uh, so boards can be more effective. I did a board retreat recently uh, for an organization. 
that will go nameless at the moment. And uh, I, I did it a half an hour. I knew it. I said, okay, so take a piece of paper and on the paper, write down a one or a 10 or anything in between. 10 is we're an effective great board or one we're doing nothing good. And most of the numbers were five and sixes. And I said, okay, so I've got five, six, five, six, seven, five, four. I said the great news about this is I got more work to do with you guys. <laughs> you should I like do nines and tens, you know, if you're running your organization. Right. So I help boards do that. And I'll go in and, and, and uh, help nonprofits kind of review their annual work plan or their three-year strategic plan and say, okay, what are you doing that's working well? How are you doing this? What is that area doing and how does that fit into your mission? A lot of times organizations will add programs because someone said or a donor says, I want you to add that program. I'll pay for it. So they add it. But the program has nothing to do with their goal or their mission. You know, if their mission is housing the homeless and someone says, I want to give you money to feed people. Well, that's not housing the homeless. There are food banks that feed people or whatever. So I do a little bit of that, a little analysis of that. And uh, I. I will, on the development side, you know, help train them to raise money. And people say, isn't it hard raising money or asking for a gift? And I go, no, it's really easy. Hmm. If I know people have the capacity to give because I've done my background research on them and they know that I work for a nonprofit and I'm going to ask for a gift. If we hit it off, it's like, it's like a dating relationship, like your girlfriend. You have a first meeting, you start to get to know each other. You like it. You have a second meeting. Maybe you take them to a, another meeting or, you know, dating it's a movie or day, whatever it might be. And the question is, you know, when do you give them that first kiss or whatever it might be? You know, maybe the first date, it may be the fourth date. But in fundraising, it's the same thing. If they want to see me and we want I have a I have lunch with a woman every quarter who's 77 years old, member of Hillcrest, gave me money four years ago, isn't ready to give me more money yet. But we still get together every quarter for lunch because we enjoy each other's company. And wow. she knows that eventually she's going to give me more money. And I thought, be patient and wait. Now, sometimes you, there are people that will, you know, scam you, if you will. And they'll, they'll meet the president of the university and they'll meet you and you'll take them to lunch and you'll take them to a concert or a ball game or whatever. And a year and a half later, they say, give me a proposal on this subject. And no proposal you give them, they accept. You finally say to them, so, yourself, they're not going to give me any money. I got to move on, you know, and that right. happens too. Right. So it really is just like dating in the sense that, you can have these really wonderful relationships that are ongoing and long lasting and are rewarding, or you're going to come across people who aren't really in the right place for dating and they're going to lead you on for a long time. Right. So, but they want that free lunch or that free dinner yeah. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Going, going back to the nonprofit side for a second from the organization back end side, what would you say is the number one red flag to an organization that you notice? Oh, that's a good question. I think when you call an organization, which is what I, when I get engaged to do work, I'll call off the street to an organization and ask for something. Like, I'm really interested in, in, in getting involved in your organization. Who can I talk to? And see, what is that? What do they do? What is their engagement with me calling in from the outside? There's a woman that wrote a book recently. Her name is Lisa Greer. And she wrote a bo book called Philanthropy Revolution. And she and her husband were basic Jews raising a family and they gave modest amounts of money. And then his company went public. They made it big. They became multimillionaires. And she called up Cedar sinai and said, I want to make a gift. Uh, my, my husband suffers from Crohn's and colitis and I want to make a gift for research. And they said, well, have someone call you back. So 10 days later, she called again and asked the same question. She called them seven times before someone actually called her back and engaged her in a conversation. It shouldn't take seven phone calls from a potential donor to an organization to say, I want to make a gift. But no one knew who, they were, who she was. They didn't do any research on them. You know, with Google, you know, today, it's easy. You Google someone. You could find out, oh, the guy's, the guy's husband, you know, uh, made, made a fortune. They want to give money away or whatever it might be. The other, the other big red flag is um, that I would say is that in the, on the financial end, on the fundraising side is take people seriously. What, don't make a judgment call as to what they can give based on where they live or what they drive. You don't know what else they're doing in their lives. And there's a story in the Christian world of a guy who 
uh, called the uh, several Christian colleges in the East, North Carolina, and South Carolina. He wanted to give them money and leave them money in his estate. And no one wanted to call and come and visit him. He lived in Huntington Beach. So finally, a guy was at a conference in San Diego and went to visit him. And the guy lived in an apartment building with about 16 units. And he had to climb the stairs to a back apartment, which was a one bedroom, small apartment, packed to the roof with, you know, all kinds of crap. He had a good conversation. The guy asked for some information. He got back to North Carolina, followed up. It turned out the guy owned that building and owned 10 other buildings. And he finally left the, the college about $10 million in cash when he died. But no one ever answered his, you know, that's a red flag, you know. Wow. Wow. I think that's a fantastic story. And that's one that we could definitely draw from. Essentially, well, we, don't we judge try. a book by its cover. I will add one thing to it. Sure. There is a midrash, and I'm not a rabbi, so I can't tell you where it came from. A midrash that outside the gates of the city, there's a homeless guy begging for money. And you don't know whether he is the Messiah or just a guy begging for money. So you got to treat him with the respect that everybody deserves because you never know who he's going to be or who he was or who he will be in the future. You know? I love that. I really, really love that. Everyone is an equal because everyone is a human at the end of the day. Everyone is just as capable of the same amount of potential. A, 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 a custodian has the same amount of potential as a CEO, basically. Well, that's like I go to a favorite restaurant of mine for breakfast in Woodland Hills which is an old coffee shop called Bobby's. It's kind of a crazy little place that they got a grill. They got the greatest hash browns in the city. But whenever not I go kosher, in there, right? Huh? Not kosher, not kosher, right? Not kosher, no. I go <laughs> in there and I always give 2 or $3 to the bus boy who takes care of me. And when I walk in the place, he's, I sit down, he comes over and says, how are you today, Gary? I say, fine, how you doing? Great. He brings me my coffee, my water, and my extra napkins. And he just, we have a good relationship. I, I only give him a couple bucks, but I, I respect him for what he does. You know? I really, really love that. I think that's really sweet. I think that's really indicative of the very generous and compassionate nature <laughs> that you have, Gary. So thank you for your work in the nonprofit world and the Jewish nonprofit world. It is uh, something that is very apparent when you get to know you and learn more about Painted Rock Advisors. For those who are listening, what is the best way to reach out to you? Uh Probably www, which we all know that's the initial if you start with, or you don't even need to do it anymore. Paintedrockadvisors.com. And you'll get my webpage and you'll have access to a newsletter. And on that webpage also is an access to my podcast, The Road to Philanthropy. And may I say that we talk about philanthropy. We, I meant to tell you the story. I didn't do that. But I just interviewed uh, the CEO of the Jewish National Fund, the wow. JNF, which is a major you know, $150 million worldwide organization. And yeah. when we were growing up as kids, our grandparents used to have the little JNF tin can on the, on the dining room table for Shabbat. And before we started Shabbat prayers, we dropped money in that little pushki, they called it. And that organization today does great work all through Israel. And they're still around. And the interview was fantastic with him. It'll be coming out probably in July if I can get my act together with my web, with my uh, producer. Uh, and get the stuff to you on time. <laughs> it really shows you that, you know, that's a, a basic thing of philanthropy is that even though no matter how poor I was growing up, my parents still gave me a quarter to leave for Sadaka at the temple on Sunday morning when I went to religious school. So I love that. I think the everlasting message that can be left for YJPs like myself is today we spend what, $20 on a lunch? Because that's how much a sandwich costs in LA now with a side and a drink around twenty dollars. Yep. Do you think it's possible to give up one of your lunches a month? How hard would it be if everyone gave up a minimum of twenty dollars a month to an organization that they believed in? How hard would it be to just put a little extra thought into giving back to the very organizations that support you and this amazing life that you have? I think that's uh, very well said, and I really do appreciate that notion, Gary. Well, my daughter was growing up and she was in middle school or high school. I forget which it was. We always discussed our philanthropy at the dining room table. And we weren't the major givers, but we were moderate givers. And she goes, well, when can I start to give money? I said, whenever you want to. What do you want to do? I want to pick it. I mean, so she ended up picking the Trevor Project, which is a very big project in the gay community to support gays who are in crisis and, and who need help based on that, that Trevor, who unfortunately was murdered uh, out in uh, whatever state it was. 
Uh, and so she still gives money to them now and it's 15 years later and she's still giving money to them every month. So wow. it's a good wow. thing. Very good thing. Well, Gary, thank you again for being on Bad Jew. And thank you to the listeners for tuning in to learn about the Jewish nonprofit world. Thank you so much for listening to Bad Jew. This has been another excellent podcast. If you like what you heard, please be sure to leave a five-star review and also a nice little comment for us to read. We really do appreciate all the feedback we can get. And if there's at any point that you want to be a part of the Bad Jew WhatsApp community, be sure to go to the link tree and fill out the contact form. We'll be able to reach out to you and get you involved as soon as possible. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Shalom. Sure.